All right, I guess I'll just go ahead and get, and get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming here, and it's a pleasure to see so many smiling faces. The intention here was to try to make this a fun, interactive exercise, which is what we do in class. And so I want to share with you something that is, I believe works pretty well, but we'll hear from the ultimate judges, the students who've been part of this this past semester, to give their frank feedback about this. Exactly a year ago, I gave a presentation on this exercise in Paris at an Academy of Creative Teaching Conference. And so actually, I'm now finding out that this is being picked up by other universities and so on. But uh, I teach a course, Global Entrepreneurship. And one of the things we talk about in an entrepreneurship course is that businesses are created, if they're going to be successful, by attempting to fill an unmet need. So I myself had an unmet need. And that was, how the heck do you get through The Economist? So I've, you know, for years when I had to pay non-academic rates for The Economist, you spent all this money for this wonderful magazine, thoroughly researched worldwide. And, you know, you get to maybe page 20 and other things come up and you're tired. I never was ever able to read The, the Entire Economist. But I wanted to know everything that was in it. So that was my unmet need. I also know that I learn a lot from talking to people. So wouldn't it be great to learn about the entire economist just by walking around talking to your friends? Particularly if it's in a structured 15 minute period in the class. So that was one of the ideas here. And plus, in the course on global entrepreneurship, how do you get people to appreciate thinking about the entire world? I mean, US people, uh, here's a great example. The Japanese got so frustrated with Americans because they were so narrowly looking at their own country the Hitachi Foundation gave $100,000 to paint world maps on basketball courts in New York City. This was one of their charitable gifts to try to get, wake people up to the fact that there's a bigger world. And then you hear you have American University, a world capital, people come here from other countries, but very often they come here because they want to see connection between their country and the United States. So maybe you have a Saudi who's come here and maybe they're paid for by the Saudi embassy, you know, just a few kilometers away, and they come here and uh, they want to mix with Americans, and they'll go back to Saudi Arabia, and maybe they'll have business dealings with Americans, maybe Europeans, but are they going to deal with Indonesians? Are they going to deal with Koreans? And, and so uh, we definitely need to build a global thinking capability, and this is especially important now. I've been running a program on sustainability management, and if we're talking about climate change and the disastrous effect of you know, burning carbon fuels for 100 years is having on the planet, you have to really be able to think about the whole world. So there's a chronic need beyond what we just do in business to attain this global perspective. I'll say some more things about that. And then I have learned from using a piece of this exercise that I'll describe here, that it's a great way to breed global thinking and how the business and politics evolve uh, um, with news stories. So I've got to show you that. And so basically, this is what we're talking about. We basically fill up a whiteboard and here we have a very small size whiteboard. The ones that I classrooms I'm in usually are about twice as wide. We have a whiteboard. I come in with a bag of about 16 or more markers. Everybody knows their role. They put the news up, and then we spend some time discussing it. So this is what I'm going to be explaining a little bit and where it came from. So why do we need a global perspective? Well, I'll get to these things in a second. But first of all, if you're in a business school or if you're in a school of international service or you're looking at nation state uh, government, from the point of view of uh, uh, School of Public Administration, or even if you were going to look at environmental things that are being filmed by the School of Communications, we definitely are looking at things from a global point of view. No company like Tesla or like General Motors or like Merck is going to put all the money into the research to develop a new product unless they have a worldwide market. So for a business point of view, it's very clear that you have to think globally. And then most of our markets now are completely international. You know, if you want to raise money, you can raise it in New York, you can raise it in London, you can raise it in Abu Dhabi, you can raise it in Tokyo. Uh, you can raise it in Sydney, you can raise it in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, you can raise it in uh, Seoul, uh, you can raise it in Bogota. And so sources for money, whether you're trying to expand your business, either by selling stocks or bonds, or whether you're trying to buy uh, commodities that are overseas and you have to convert currencies, all these markets that are international. And so we definitely need a global perspective from that point of view. But now, just thinking about how we manage the world and if we're going to breed the change agents that our lunchtime speaker talked about, uh, we really need people who are reckoning, reckoning with the fact that we have real limits of resources. 
fact, the Japanese have an interesting thing. They call things urban mines now to try to get people to turn in their old cell phones and their laptops and things like that because of all the rare earth minerals that are in those devices that we need. We're not going to find them in Africa. But the Chinese are already there digging them up. And so what are we going to use? When the, Japan was hit by the tsunami, they wanted to overdrive in the uh, copper mines of, Ch of Chile to pull out the new copper that they're going to need to lay all the new wires in Japan. And so the, we recognize there are those real resource limits. And climate change is severely impacting all of us. We have the worst droughts in history now going on in California and in Texas. The worst situation they've ever faced in Singapore. Now, some people are saying that the civil war in Syria was entirely predictable just because of falling rainwater and the agricultural stress that was going to cause and the lack of food. So, you know, that we recognize that climate change is very significant. And then the health effects that come with that, health threats, whether it's diseases, Ebola, or avian flu, or other kinds of things might come from ill-treated water and so on. And then I think the ref refugee situation in the world now is worse than any time since World War II. And uh, it's tragic, except that we are grooming talented people that might go out and do something about it. So that's one thing. So uh, what's the idea here? Let's try some new approaches, because most people aren't necessarily reaching a global perspective, unless global means Nike shoes and Adidas sweatshirts. Uh, you don't see necessarily global things, or uh, 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 A-Rod and uh, some uh, music rapper, you know, maybe that's global, but it's, we haven't really reached this thing, and so we need to find some new approaches. What I have really done a lot since I've been a faculty member here is figuring out ways to map things that I learned from experience into the classroom so that we can learn through interactions and activities in class. And to force a broader perspective, if people are being marched around the world and have to do news reporting from every region, that's going to force a broader perspective and make them look at the entire world. And because we're looking at business things as well as market things, uh, in addition to political things that might be happening on the ground, we're definitely getting a chance to monitor what's happening on the ground, different parts of the world, different markets around the world. And so I like to think that we're building a strategic awareness, a readiness to act, and a breadth of vision that takes in the whole world. And to really to be alert to global opportunities and threats. So the concept here, let's read The Economist magazine and learn about it by talking with people. So it's an interactive reading of The, of the Economist. So the fact of that it's glib, it's often very glib. Especially right. their covers, right? <laughs> their covers. There was a wonderful cover I'll never forget of Nakasone, Prime Minister of Japan, and he's sitting there meditating and it says, action please. Uh, so. So, uh, and uh, the other thing that I've been inspired by for years has been these quotes from astronauts who talk about by going into space and zipping around the Earth. It only takes an hour and a half to go around the Earth. So that they, it changes them. So like, a, and I'll show you some quotes from astronauts later on to prompt this, but uh, astronauts sail around the world and it, they come back. So a Russian guy went up, looks around, says, oh, there's Moscow. Go around another time, there's Mother Russia. Go around another time, there's Eurasia. Go around another time, there's the Northern Hemisphere. There's the Earth. So after they've been there for a while, they think about themselves and where do they come from in a new way. Why can't we imitate that in class? And drag people around the world as reporters so they come back with a broader perspective. So here's what we do, and I've tried to put it here up on the board. By the way, those people came in late. Uh, we have some students here who've just lived through this who are going to talk about what it felt like, but what I was hoping to do in the interim was to give you all some sample things that you can come up here and put the news up. So I'll lecture for 20 minutes, we'll try it out for a little bit, and then we'll have the students talk about it. We'll see how much other people come in. But basically, here's the layout, the top half of the board, the bottom half of the board. If you're in one of those nice classrooms with the boards that can slide up and down, you have plenty of room. But even for a classroom, we, if we had to do it in this room, we could. Most of the rooms I have access to have a larger board than this. So what's going on here? We typically have 35 people in this class. We could get by with 20. We could get by actually with 16. Uh, we meet for several weeks, 15 weeks. Once a week, we have a large whiteboard. Everyone reads The Economist. They can supplement that with The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, or Le Monde, or Der Spiegel, or things like that, or uh, Nikkei News, whatever it is. And we use Google Docs to accumulate a history. And we use Twitter to give that sort of 
final oomph at the end about what was the key lesson that they walked away from the class experience with. So, why The Economist? How many of you read The Economist? I guess you wouldn't have come here if you didn't already. So, uh, uh, how many of you are able to read the entire magazine? Or as much as you want in one sitting? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> All right, well anyway, most of us, myself especially, can't. So, but this is the, the magazine that world leaders read. Business and government people. In fact, there's a wonderful story, this is true. I visited Robben Island in South Africa, right off the coast, where uh, our wonderful uh, South African leader, may he rest in peace, lived for 28 years, 27 years. So uh, this is Nelson Mandela. So they weren't horrible jailers. They just put them through tough work, but they didn't really necessarily torture them. And they, in fact, they encouraged their education. So the prisoners didn't know. They said, what do you want to read? So Nelson Mandela said, I want to read The Economist. So they figured, oh, OK, he wants to learn economics, fine. Well, meanwhile, he spent 27 years learning how to be a world leader. So when he emerged, he wanted to declare, and he said, hey, look, you know, what are we going to do? Let's have a partnership here. And he then walked out on the balcony and said, oh, I can work with this man. And so when he's trained to be a world leader in prison, reading The Economist. It also explains a lot about how the world works, and it does nice coverage of all sections of the world. But it's unwieldy. So we also add the Wall Street Journal, particularly get financial markets and other publications that may be people's interests. The other thing to add here is with our student body here, where you have such a fascinating mix of people from the entire world, you bring the different perspectives that all the students have. So I'll say some more things about that in a second. Well, what is my role as the instructor? Well, you, people can take different points of view. Explain the exercise. Get people organized, make sure they understand their roles, set up the, the capabilities on Twitter and on uh, Blackboard with Google Docs, and then beat the drum. You know, the, okay, now you're gonna do this, now you're gonna do this. And basically we engage, maybe every once in a while we have some people talk out loud, maybe challenge them all, what do you exactly mean by that? What does your French compatriot here say about that? And so we can go back and forth and people can express their opinion. And then uh, there is a follow-up, which I'll describe, to make sure people do their work. So where might this fit? So I'm sorry we don't have Frank DuBois here, who was planning to come. He teaches the IB faculty, but uh, we have Giaz here. So international business, strategic management, I've been using it in global entrepreneurship. I'm going to use some variation of this in one of my sustainability courses. But could be business government relations, uh, an international development thing in an SIS. Um, international institutions, multilateral organizations, certainly World Bank people have to have this perspective, and then getting into the politics of trade. So those are some examples of where it might work. So how do I do this? First, I introduce it, explain the layout of the board, give everyone their first roles, and then show a photograph of the Earth and quotes from astronauts to sort of get people pumped up on how they're being vicarious astronauts. By the way, a guy who's coming into the uh, sustainability program next year, his uncle's an astronaut, so. Uh, I grab and I said, you know, you got to come to campus and talk about how you feel you were changed. The keynote speaker at this year's CAS graduation is the head of NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and so she will bring that. She talks about how she was changed from the experience of being an astronaut, really changed her as a person. So we try to get motivated for this, and then every week we go through a process first of reading the news and getting ready to make your post and putting the the first thing out on a Google Docs that we reach through Blackboard. Then we come to class and we write it on the whiteboard in class, like we're showing here. Then after class and the mingling that we do, I ask people to take out the, the most salient or the most interesting thing they learned that day and write a tweet about it. And then uh, you rotate from topic to topic, week to week. So here's the picture I show. Now, it used to always bother me, you know, why are we always showing North America there? But now I've come to another recognition we're thanking our sponsors. This is NASA thanking the citizen taxpayers of the United States who paid for the lunar excursion module that got these pictures. So this is you know, a salute to the sponsor that got these programs here. So here it is again, and here's a way to think about it. Basically, here are the different regions of the world, simplified into a set of eight. And here are business kinds of news and financial markets kind of news. And as I'll mention at the end, I previously had been using this kind of thing as the entire board for a long time in my regular capstone course. Um, and uh, when I figured, well, now I also have responsibility for making people think about themselves as, as being global, 
as global citizens, let's shove this in here also. So basically people rotate from week to week, from topic to topic. When they get to the end, they wrap around, start here. And so there are 16 topics here in a 15 week course, you get almost every topic. So here are some pictures of what it looks like. You can see people are clearly engaged. I'm not doing anything. I'm on the side, counting time, making sure that people aren't dilly-dallying. Uh, maybe, maybe if, for example, if I saw all the German students staying together in a cluster, I'd come and bust them up, make sure that they're work, interacting with some of the other students. But you can see that there's quite a bit of engagement. By the way, this picture was on the front page of the Washington Post a couple years ago. Somebody uh, came to class to cover that. So we have weekly assignment of the news. We rotate news topics, 16 topics over 15 weeks. Uh, if you have 30 people in the class, you can have two people covering each subject so they can back each other up. And uh, I'll be trying it this time uh, with a smaller class. We'll see if it works when you only have one person responsible for each topic. Uh, but we're forcing this worldwide perspective, and they're looking at business and markets as well as different regions. So just a few more things here. So I like to think of the Sunday model. What do we do beforehand? What do we do in class? What do we do afterwards? Beforehand, we study the news. We write our news entry on a Google Docs document. I have some samples of these here. Where is it here? Uh, the, uh, I'll actually hand out, we actually have you all come up here and present these things, and we'll just show it around here. There we go. Just pass this around. So basically, you're cumulatively adding to the news coverage that's been done weekly. So the newest ones are just put on the top. So if you, your job is to just put up the latest entry, but if you want to enrich your education and see what's been going on for the past year, it's all right there by section. So you can study the news, write your news entry, and then you can study as much as you want from the past. Then we come to class and we mingle and share with each other after it's been put on the board. And then at the end of class, I want people to sort of reinforce as a community and then to share with our wider networks uh, the key lessons that have happened. And so there was one very interesting thing that happened. Well, uh, first of all, if you think of a Sunday, you know, ice cream Sunday, you get the bowl of vanilla ice cream, and the chocolate syrup on top, and then a bright red cherry. Well, that's what I think. This is the ice cream. The class is the chocolate syrup. And the tweet is the cherry on top. So they all sort of come together. And what's kind of fun is seeing how the tweets then broaden the communication out to their Twitter network. So for example, one Japanese student had written about the pollution problems in China, and he sent it out as one of his tweets, uh, his friends from Japan who were studying in China were able to then respond to him and talk about what it was like, the pollution problems they were experiencing as they went to school in Beijing. So uh, it really, I would like to think, elevates the discussion that happens in the students' private networks. So once again, what is it? For prep, you learn your topic, you post to Google Docs, a cumulative history, you come to class, you write it on the board, and then you discuss interactively, and then afterwards you write a tweet and then uh, you get, start getting background to the next topic. So uh, how do we do this? First, I ask people to start from a region they know well, wrote their, their coverage from week to week, mix and mingle. I have several suggested ways to do things. Maybe since if there are two people covering a topic, we can have one person go and roam and the other person stay and cover their topic. And uh, uh, in this course, I also ask everyone to learn about another part of the world. So they have to have a cross-cultural buddy so right there on the board each week is the key news stories from the region that their body came from, so that's something. And we can ask them to go back where they were, say, a quarter of the world ago, like four weeks ago, go back to that and check in with that. So we have all this up there every week, interacting. So uh, this is, uh, gives you a feel for what it looks like in a standard. Now, how do you make sure that people are not just goofing around and talking about the weekend? because uh, other times in the class, I think it's, it's okay for them to talk about the weekend if they're doing it with their cross-cultural buddy, but not during this exercise. So uh, maybe we point out some specific thing and take a longer discussion about it. Some students have suggested maybe I should just call on somebody and have them come up front and talk about their area some more. I count the tweets, make sure that people do write their tweets each week. I learn from experience. If I don't, they don't do it. Um, and then uh, I also have them go around and write on index cards 
now, all these main things they learned about. And if anyone wants to do data analysis on that, figure out whether or not they really have achieved a global perspective, I'd be happy to discuss that. And maybe we'll spotlight some of this. And then at, uh, at the end, we'll kind of evaluate the lessons learned. Certainly a final exam question is what did you learn from this experience? And uh, again, our three people who are here who did this this past semester, I look forward to learning from you. So what do I think of the benefits from this? Well, first, we can chunk the idea, so mentally chunk the idea of being global. Right? People have a new appreciation of what that means. I'm training for an international world and orchestrate international interactions. In uh, this class that I teach it in, often I have 18 nationalities from every continent. And so that's one of the wonderful things about the American University classroom. With the right title, you can attract people from all over the world. And 18 nationalities makes this fantastic setting to have this kind of interaction. So one guy who was not even able to be here, but who wrote up his reactions, talked about how he was always very well informed, but because of these orchestrated discussions with, say, the five German students we had in the room, they started to give him a whole different point of view on things that he never had before. And now he's reading Dear Spiegel. And he's changed his view about whether or not Greece should be part of the European community and things like that. So it's an interesting kind of thing. Uh, one person from a, a, a Caribbean country where he lacked some confidence, felt he, he built a social confidence mingling in the classroom, talking about the news uh, in a way, and being an expert at something as you talk to other people. And then you certainly learn to see beyond your own region because you're responsible for covering it, and you're learning through constructive interaction, and you basically get to read The Economist without having to read it all. So here it is again. And uh, I global entrepreneurship course, not only do I want them to think globally, and be well informed globally and see how the world works, but we also want to learn about situations in every part of the world. So I, com I combine this with business cases from every region of the world and videos from every region of the world, and we have an international text and everybody has to have a buddy from another culture. So that's how we reinforce these things here. So of course we'll hear in a moment what the student benefits are, but I would say it breeds a global perspective it breeds a task-oriented social interaction. Students are responsible for their own learning. I'm just creating the context. And then uh, I find that people are pretty eager for more international interaction. And what's kind of fun is you see people like uh, going away with their cultural buddy on spring break, like to Las Vegas or something like that, <laughs> or going to a baseball game, and things like that. And so it, uh, combining the thinking of the news with some of these other activities definitely makes people more broad-minded. So again, geographic coverage on the left, business and financial coverage on the right, and uh, so okay, the student body makes sense. I'll just share with you quickly the quotes from the astronauts that you might find a little bit useful. Oops. So a wonderful quote from an astronomer, Fred Hoyle, 1948, before we ever had any space shots. Once a photograph of the Earth taken from the outside is available, a new idea as powerful as any in history will be let loose. And then I have these quotes from different uh, astronauts who came back. This is from a wonderful book called The Home Planet, which has stunning photographs and very wise quotations from these people who've had this privileged opportunity. Now, by the way, if Virgin Galactic figures out how to get its act together after the accidents this fall, you all can be space tourists too, probably in your lifetime. Right now it's pretty expensive, but they're expecting the price will eventually come down to about the level of a Tahiti vacation or a space elevator. So you might have this experience too, but right now we can rely on these quotes. So a Russian guy zooming around the earth, right? It's incomparable beauty, the enthralling panorama of the earth. Suddenly you've got a feeling you've never had before that you're an inhabitant of the earth. Or the Syrian guy, from space I saw Earth indescribably beautiful with the scars of national boundaries gone. So there's several more quotes here. I won't necessarily go over them all right now because uh, we have two, four, six, eight, nine people here. So we don't really have enough people to fill up all these topics. Do you guys want to do it anyway? Want to come up and write something on the board? How many of you are eager for dessert? Um, yeah. Your 
do you try to control for kind of a Euro-American perspective when you're teaching? I mean, I'm, I'm particularly aware of the fact that uh, the, the media is 24-7 uh, on the tragedy in Paris. A hundred people were killed by Boko Haram in Nigeria. We don't hear about it. You know, we don't hear about it. I mean, at the same time, a hundred people were killed, twelve people were killed in Paris, or the, the attack on, on uh, the, the magazine. So how do you control for that? And do you control for that? Because you're educating students to uh, presumably the, I, I don't, what, do, your, do the international students tend to return home? Do they stay? in uh, the West, quote unquote, uh, and how do, and how does, so how do you do, and, and should you control, maybe you should control for, uh, or maybe you, maybe you should huh. acknowledge that this is from a Euro-American perspective, because that's the environment in which they're going to be working. Oh, well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, that's number one. So, for example, the Haitian guy is probably going to go back and work with his family business in Haiti. And the, uh, well, I don't know, are you going to open a Brazilian restaurant? Um, <laughs> maybe. maybe. Uh, I mean, that, that's definitely one of the comments that I had about the exercise is that um, because we have so many different nationalities in the class, so people come from different backgrounds. Um, through this exercise, you can kind of hear their different perspectives and maybe their hidden stereotypes or their hidden um, just ideas that you wouldn't normally get to see in a classroom. And so that's one of the benefits. Um, but I do think that kind of controls for it because everyone does um, have different perspectives or from their backgrounds, from their family history. And so it's interesting to see that because it doesn't it doesn't always lean toward a Eurasian, uh, a American Western perspective. But. Um, I think that the uh, it's it's a very important point. I, the best way we have thus far of addressing it, and maybe we can come up with better ones, is that there's equal space for every region. Right. So you could be sure that under Africa that would be covered next week. Now, do I know that they are spending as much time talking about it when they're mingling? Uh, I don't know that. Do I know that we're also getting, say, uh, uh, Manchester Guardian perspective and not just Times of London or, or Washington Post perspective, I don't know that. But that's become some of the interesting things that come up in the discussions. So every once in a while I'm alert to say like some group or cluster of students in this discussion right in front of the board get really kind of animated. It's often because a, a, a European perspective differed from an American perspective and they're a little bit of loggerheads like, how can you say that? And uh, now, could we tease it out more? We probably can. Uh, the, I guess probably the best way I have been able to do this is with the cases that come along with it. So, uh, for example, I have an Indonesian case about a family business company that doesn't want to pay minimum wage. Because if they pay minimum wage, they can't compete with, they're Filipino and they can't compete with Indonesia. Because Indonesia's minimum wage is much less than the Philippines. So. Marxist people infiltrated, went on strike, they shut down the plant, it's been closed for a couple years, and the family's trying to decide should they reopen it. And the question is, is capitalism the answer? And so we can, we can have that kind of discussion in class, but I don't know if I'm forcing them to get out of their European American point of view. So, uh, yes? But don't you see their thought processes reflected in their posts on Blackboard? Or do you monitor that? Isn't that what the okay, so why don't we have, uh, uh, probably we're going to have a good discussion. Why don't have the students come up here? Go. <laughs> and I want to thank them very much for coming back early, right? They, they came back early to do this. So I would particularly appreciate you doing this. Of course, it is your education. Right? Did they pass the course? Yes, it has. <laughs> now, uh, I hope so. As we've said, uh, we all have to get tougher on our grading. Uh -huh. So oh but boy, even yeah. if we get tougher on them, there was a big outrage here with some of the yeah. students about that. Uh, <laughs> but they would still pass even when uh -huh. they were uh -huh. uh -huh. OK. So sure. Tish, you want to start it? Yeah, uh, it, will, it will help, yeah. OK, I'll, I'll try to do that.
Tish, you want to start off? Uh, well, uh, I'm Tish. I'm a junior. I just took his class last semester. This is all kind of short notice for okay. me. Um, I just got off work and I didn't prepare anything, but um, I really appreciate appreciated like uh, doing the global news washboard because we got a different perspective on like in the different regions of the entire world and it was very interesting because I don't know it just kind of like took us out of like our college bubble because in college like the average college kid college kid might not like turn on the news because I don't know they sleep in late they have so much homework to do that they don't even bother with it um so it's just kind of like a new perspective outside of college so my name is Abigail Frost I'm a senior um and I have the same kind of opinions about it. It was a great way to be in tune to the news but not have to put too much time in um, looking at everything. Um, I think it was good for a classroom dynamic to have more interaction and also to have the pairing up because um, like I didn't know anyone in the class when I started and so I just went up to a random girl <laughs> and said hey do you want to be my partner and that's kind of how I think it was for most people. Um, you get to know someone a little bit better, uh, which was really nice. Um, but most classes, you don't have that social interaction very much. It's just kind of a so a interaction with the professor. Um, and so I think it really helped the classroom dynamic. And then um, going back to what I was saying before, um, I think it was interesting to kind of get people's hidden perspectives about what's going on in the news um, based on their how they grew up or the different classes that they've taken, the different ways that they would articulate what was going on in the news was always interesting. Um, so those are my, my takeaways from the exercise. Hi, my name is Brian Hagara. I'm a senior in SIS, and I'm not sure whether my colleagues are in SIS or whether you are professors for SIS or COGOD or SPA, but I'll kind of talk about how my experience differentiated as an SIS student in this class and how it compares to SIS programs. So uh, the program is basically set up to kind of create a pond that's a mile wide but an inch deep, so you learn a lot about different regions of the world but because you only spend one week studying that region, you're not really getting an in-depth knowledge. And I find this approach is really different from the SIS curriculum because in a lot of ways, we're taught to specialize in a certain region. And so we learn a lot about that area and we, you know, we follow it in the news. So for instance, my regional specialization is East Asia, particularly China. So I usually study Chinese history, Chinese economics, Chinese business practice and inner business relations between China and the surrounding countries in the US. But with this course, I was able to look at all different countries around the world and kind of apply what I've learned in SIS to these different countries and see about how they varied and also look at it from a business perspective, which was very different and not something we usually do in SIS. Um, the class makeup was very different from SIS, I found, because you know SIS, we consider it an international program. But the fact of the matter is that I, I, you know, I'm going to make up a statistic here, but I suspect probably 70% or more of the students in the program are Americans who are of a similar political persuasion and think in similar ways. So and in the, res the result of that is in class, discussion is sort of centered in certain directions. There's not a lot of disagreement or debate. It's mostly just people reiterating what their colleagues have already said that they agree with. However, in this course with this program, we are forced to interact with other people. And like the professor said, at least half of the class was from different nationalities. So you weren't just representing the news to about the Middle East to some any like any American, you were telling the US perspective on the news to somebody who was from the region. So a lot of times what I found is there would be a bit of a pushback or feedback where they'd say it's really interesting that you, you know, you, you explain that point this way because you know I think about it totally differently. And a lot of times that would encourage natural discussion and debate that you would normally not get in a curriculum experience. And I really found that that was the biggest benefit of this sort of educational technique is that because of the class makeup of global excuse me of global entrepreneurship we were able to interact with people of other cultures who were not shy about telling you whether they thought that your opinion of the news for that week was spot on or not and I really was enjoying that but you told them they were wrong oh no <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and uh, maybe uh, I could share with you one other student who intended to be here, but uh, family issues came up. 
I consider myself to be fairly well informed. I read the newspaper as often as I can, usually the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and I keep track of multiple RSS feeds from other news organizations such as CNN and BBC. That's a pretty interesting kid. However, despite these efforts, these dedicated towards keeping myself abreast of world affairs, a full-time class schedule uh, prevents me from, I find that the news can slip through the cracks. This semester in Global News Watch Board exercise was an excellent way for me to keep track of events around the world, from the continuing Euro crisis to the heightening tensions of the South China Sea. It was immensely useful for me to learn about what was happening in regions of the world that I don't typically keep track of, and then be able to see how these events might then affect other seemingly related un, uh, unrelated situations. Uh, these connections I formed caused me to vary my news sources away from the typical American news organizations, instead gain additional insights from other international papers such as Dear Spiegel and The Independent. The large number of international students in the class also exposed me to new and different perspectives on existing information and events, occasionally causing me to reevaluate my thinking an opinion on a similar situation. So the example he gave, I mentioned briefly earlier, was uh, what's happening with the economic crisis in Europe, and what's the role of Greece, what's the role of the rest of Europe to bail out Greece, whatever you want to call it, and whether or not Greece should remain part of the Eurozone. And so he said, well, of course it should. And so the German students came and discussed with him pretty <laughs> strongly. And uh, the, he's the, they, basically, he's now convinced that it may not be the best political situation for uh, Greece to be part of Europe. So throughout the semester, insights such as these have allowed me to attain a deeper understanding of why these issues have arisen, which I then use to see the issues in a different light and evolve my understanding of their occurrence. In the future, I plan to continue going beyond my usual sources, widening my horizons and making sense of the world around me. Now, let me just say this student took this course with me now, but he's going to be taking my other class this spring, where I do just the right-hand side of the board. So if you would imagine, imagine this part is not here, and we take these parts and spread them out. So we have the, the news stories here, and the market stories here, and in that format, it's a wonderful way to watch how things evolve. Like maybe Microsoft does something, and we see how the stock market moves or oil prices come down, and we see about Putin trying to work out some kind of deal with Turkey. And so we start to see those kind of connections. And I know, I have to tell you guys this, but former students of mine tried to get jobs in New York at a time when the cycle was down and they couldn't get any jobs. So this one kid took a course at New York Institute of Finance before going back home to South America, and he started raising things that came out of the discussions that we had and a man came up to him and hired him on the spot. So I know that this kind of discussion format and the broadened thinking it engenders is unique. And um, anyway, so I'll be quiet now and let you guys have a second round if you want to say some more things. So um, you could probably apply this platform, and this is something I was just thinking about a little while ago while Professor Benoz was talking about it. You could probably apply this platform to just about any of the schools in American University. And yeah. You'd keep the left side of the board, of course, and then this business-oriented side, you could change the topics. So in SIS, instead of having, you know, like all of these, we could have a topic on, you know, NGOs, on um, international development, human rights, um, war and crisis and conflict, and you could really just change it so that it applies to perhaps whatever your course is centered on. That's exactly what I'm doing in a new sustainability course I'm talking about. I'm teaching <laughs> spring. We're adding climate news, and government policy news about the, the climate as special topics. So that's good. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Hey, uh, the student provided with the free copy of the no. Economist. Mm -hmm. No, but that's a cheap have, textbook. You have, you have to buy it. It's but we get a good discount. It's Number also one. available in the library. Yeah, the you library just have has to make time to get it. Okay. The real question is, do you have a specific time in the classroom that you will address these issues? Yes. Or how, how many minutes? Okay, so ideally they come before class. <laughs> I'm there, label the board with a whole bag full of markers. And uh, some people say they look forward to coming to class for it. So they put it up, and then in a two and a half hour block class, we'll maybe spend 15 minutes sometime in the first half of class. I say, okay, you know, everybody up, down in the pit. 
So you meet once a week? We meet once a week. Oh, I see. Okay. So 150 minutes. 160 minutes. Right. And we yeah. spent about 15, what you say, about 15, 20 minutes? Yeah. Was that enough? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Enough time to go around to a couple different people and talk. And the index cards help keep track of who you were talking to, what you had learned, um, and also kind of realize, oh, maybe I'm centering on a certain area. I'll check out another area next time. So, for example, Brian will be in charge of, of focusing on Africa and you are and focusing on Latin America and so on, right? Well, yeah. for the reporting okay, going up is one thing, uh -huh. so that's one kind of writing. But then, once they've done their reporting job, then their job is to be a consumer and walk around and talk to other people, and they keep notes from there. So that's the note cards. Oh, these are the other subjects that they're learning about as they walk around and talk. And actually, I have all of those cards. Maybe I should give like a, a bonus to people that they cover more than eight topics or something like that. Oh, yeah. So they post first. They post, they post to Blackboard these sheets that were passed around. Right. Yeah. So to the whiteboard. They, they first post it to, to Blackboard. through Blackboard onto Google Docs. So that's our permanent historical record. OK, so I would talk about, for example, Switzerland denied uh, right. Whatever. So I would give you a market, and you'd come and write it down, and you'd write a couple sentences here. Okay. And then, in so you've done it on Blackboard, right, and you've question. written a simpler version of it here. Okay. Then I say, everybody in the pit, we come up front, and you mingle around. And so you're an expert on that, but you're talking to her about this, and you're talking about her about that. Mm -hmm. So everybody's doing Everybody's that. mingling yeah. around. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I try to... Minutes for about 15 minutes and we maybe say, okay, partner A, you move, partner B, you stay where you are. Oh, okay, right. Or go to where you were six weeks ago, and check in. Go to where your, look at what's happening in your buddy's area. Mm -hmm. So we try to add those variations and that's, I'm really open to your ideas on other things we can do about that, if it's valuable to do those kind of things. I think um, some suggestions for that is, a lot of times what my experience happened is we go into this you know, we'd go to the pit, so to speak, and you know, you talk to the same three or four students, so you make your little mini circle of those four, and we take turns talking about each person's news, and you know, we discuss about that, but you really wouldn't talk to that many other students, so perhaps suggested improvements are, you have one person, like, you know, you know how you do the numbers, you could do that and say, all right, you have to go talk to that random person, then you can talk to your friends or whoever you want to afterwards. So force a, So force random variables into the interactions and then that way. And that could also be a technique you could use if you don't want to devote as much time to it where you know each person has you know you make groups of three that are randomized with like you know the note cards that have one so all groups of one go to this corner twos, threes, fours, fives and then the three people can quickly talk about their news in a much shorter period of time and it could save a lot of class time if you okay, find that 15 minutes is too long to devote to the task. Uh, I'll, I'll just say, that I've noticed a big difference in the layout of the room, because we were in the room that you all were in, which is one of those nice, beautiful bowl rooms. There's a lot of room between the board and the seats, so the students could sort of disperse. But in the photographs I showed you, which was the typical Kokai classroom, you only have about 10 feet. So they are all much, mm -hmm. so there was a lot more mixing going on there. I noticed in your class, people tend to fall into clusters. Yeah. And uh, I, I watched that happen and didn't know what to do. <laughs> I'm curious how the dynamic of your class, um, I'm coming from the GW Teaching and Learning Center, so I'm interested in this as kind of from the uh, pedagogy and as an innovative you know, um, activity in class. I'm wondering uh, how it's changed the dynamic of your class because I'm assuming you haven't always done this activity, so what was it like before, and then what changed when you started to do this? Well, well, I do a lot of different uh, activities in class, <laughs> learning by doing, and so uh, maybe it would just be better for them to talk about how they feel the culture of this class was similar or not similar to other classes they've been in, and then I can yeah. brief you separately. On yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, I really like this class because you're not just sitting for like the entire class period like in most other classes you're actually like communicating with like friends and classmates and like actually discussing certain topics mm -hmm. um, because after we would do the global news watch board we would discuss our case discussion that we had to read as well um, which tied into like certain things in the global news watch board and it was just 
more attention grabbing and not necessarily just through sitting there getting bored from your professor lecturing. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In terms of cases, we did a Latin American case, we did an African case, we did a South Asian case, we did a Middle Eastern case, So, and then we did videos from each of these, so uh -huh. that in addition to this worldwide perspective, on the first 15 minutes of class, the first half of class, we would do a case in a video that would, over the course of the semester, take us over the world. So uh, we, we did global, some of it each week, and then other parts from week to week. culture of the class? Um, I mean, kind of going off what you were saying, um, I, I think there's a very clear dynamic difference in the SIS. I'm also in the School of International Service, and so there's a huge difference between those classes where it's primarily just being lectured at, taking notes. Um, there's a little bit of class discussion, but again, it's primarily like um, a bunch of white kids in the class kind of giving their projections of um, development, really. And in my... Parroting their professors? Um, it's very similar, yeah. Um, but in COGOD, in the business classes, there's a lot more um, just d like diversity in the classroom in terms of both um, background, but your race, ethnicity, all of that kind of stuff. So there's automatically a little bit better of a discussion, but the classes are way more um, tangible and more um, interactive, and you're taking what you're learning and actually putting it into action in the COVID classes. And so this was one of the same exercises that really enforced that and fostered that kind of um, class discussion, but also more of a class unity and getting to know people more, um, feeling more comfortable in the class. So. I think I think this is a great activity for that, um, but there's definitely a culture difference between um, the different schools on campus and the way that the classrooms are run. Going with that, I felt that the way that this model works is that it forces you to look at how the subject matter is applicable to the news. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, this is my first course I've ever taken on entrepreneurship, and as we go through each of the sections, you know, you'd kind of train your mind to look for this characteristic in more and more of the news. So you'd hear about a terrorist attack in the Middle East or somewhere, and you'd wonder what the economic ramifications of that would be. And then you'd see it in the commodity prices for the next couple of weeks, and you could kind of reinforce those sort of multifaceted learning mm -hmm. That's true. matters. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm still quite sure about the Each person has one topic each week. Only one. One, one they choose one topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they have this one this week, mm -hmm. they don't get to choose what's next week. It's assigned. And then after next week, it's assigned. I see. So, so they, it's, it's a step-by-step -step rotation. I see. So let's say that the first class I chose Africa, and then next week I need to choose something else. No, you'll be told you automatically go to South Asia. South Asia. And then automatically go to Southeast. And then I have to upload uh, what I found on the Blackboard at a comp class and I write down on board. That's that's what we were gonna do here. I was, I have markers. Yeah, here. So I have so, so what's what uh, is on that sheet of paper, what we upload to Blackboard is like a more in depth summary mm -hmm. about the article that we read. Mm -hmm. And up here we would just put like one or two bullet points that really would grab someone's attention and then you would start the discussion like oh hey that seems really interesting like can you explain more about it um, is say, hopefully what would happen. Uh, we have 35 students then all of them can actually write things down on the yeah. yeah, so at the beginning of um, the semester we had to find a partner so you're paired up at least if our class was like 35 students, so yeah. we had enough for everyone to have a partner. And you choose um, one of the items on the board, mm -hmm. and then for the rest of the semester, you're rotating through all the other items. So by the end of the semester, you've completed all of the um, all of the different sections, but the only choice you had was your partner and like where you started, but you end up going through all of the different items and um, each week looking at different articles and then choosing which one you wanted and then you go on Blackboard and do the summary and then you come to class and you do the bullet points and then you write your index cards, what you've learned, and then you tweet about it. So it's a whole progression. 
so, so uh, you know, I would hope if there's one result is that people start to use the concept of global with a level of understanding. Mm -hmm. That they may have come, uh, where are you from, Korea? Yeah. So you might think I'm Korean, I care about what's happening in Japan and China, I'm living in the United States, I don't know so much about Africa, I don't know so much about Iran. Well, you will okay. after doing this class. What is going on in the world right now? Right. So each time I go to class and then I have this kind of discussion, after 15 or 20 minutes, I learn basically what is going on out there. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of collect all the information. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, so the, a little bit of this is the learning by doing. I used to work on Wall Street before I became a professor. And so if you walk in, say, to the trading floors of the big banks on Wall Street, they have a news wire running across, People on the bond trading desk maybe have like 15 different kinds of displays. So they're being bombarded all the time. You live in that environment for a while, you start to feel the pace, you start to see connections between things. And so it's kind of a gradual enlightenment or debasement, I don't know, <laughs> uh, awareness building. Awareness, yes. and, yeah. and so that's what this does. It, it, as a result of 15 weeks of doing this, uh, it's my hope that people now think of themselves much more broadly and are more aware. And so, for example, if a political thing happened in the Philippines, they try to maybe connect it to what's happening in Iran uh, or what's happening in France. Um, and uh, but the, the even more powerful thing is when the, that I find uh, looking at connections between the business stories and the markets or politics and markets, and starting to uh, watch uh, how the world works. And uh, so the oil price, fracking in America has lowered the price of oil, and now with the Saudis not deciding that they're gonna turn off the spigot, it's lowered the price of oil, which is causing a crisis in Venezuela and a crisis in Russia, and now Putin's blowhard stuff is being thrown in his face because he can't support his economy. And we have earthquakes in Florida. And we have earthquakes in Florida. So, you know, what would that do for the pipeline that they might have built? Um, you know, so we start to see some of these kinds of interrelationships. Uh, and it, it's very important, you know, when people leave here, if they go into business, maybe they go into a bank or an NGO or something like that, probably they'll be focused on one particular region. But if they climb up in a hierarchy, whether it's the World Bank or ch Christian Charities or Citibank, once they get to a level, they're in a different country every week, every day. And so those people have to be able to jump frames of reference like that. And that's the world that I came from. So then after all these uh, activities, probably you Command or summarize what we see on the board, or otherwise, how in the world uh, that sort of activities can be related to the rest of the class? Because I can ask them a question on the final exam and ask them to do it. Which brings up how are the, how are, how will you all assess? Um, we had um, an, a final exam that was, I believe, fourteen short answer questions that spanned uh, different topics of the class. Like we had a section of questions based off of the Global News Watch Board. We had a section of questions based off of each of the exam, each of the essays that we wrote. And then one based off of like, generally overall how to be like the class. Um, and it was all open note and everything. So we could reference like so what we had done, all, what? all open note. Open so we had access to all of the uh, posts that we had written about uh, the Global News Watch Board um, for, for snapshots reference. snapshots of the board through the weeks or? No. We can access each other's Google Docs so for- that um, thing that was passed Blackboard, around. Yeah. That's all on yeah. Blackboard. Yeah, so, and throughout the semester, I mean, this was just one of the things that we did in terms of like participation, but we also had um, like three big papers and assignments that we completed and um, it's the tweets for this assignment that were part of our kind of like um, participation. And so we were graded on a bunch of different things, but 
Um, in terms of the final exam, we were able to access all of the different tools that we use for this, for example, to reflect and connect all of the dots together. So I would say this was maybe 15, 20% of the course. And so let's just slow do this. For example, here was the top printing from the Google Docs covering the Economist cover. And here is the front page covering the Middle East. Now, if you went to this Google Doc, I've only shown you the first page here, the latest issue. But there's actually like 15 pages of this going back to The Economist of the past year and a half. And similarly for here, you can look at a year and a half worth of history of the Middle East. So if people want to get more background, it's there. It's there automatically through The Economist, right? It, they organize it that way, they categorize it that yes. way? They, uh, the students have, uh, pull things from The Economist or other sources. It's not only The Economist. With the link. They might have used the link, sure. but they still have to write a paragraph or so. Yeah. So they still have to write something. They're not just pointing to something. Great. That's fantastic. So, uh, well, here's a far Are any of you going to change your career based on anything you realize doing this? Well, well I was already a global entrepreneurship major, so. <laughs> Well, I'm an SIS, but I actually am going into sales and marketing, so I'm, very different. <laughs> I'm SIS, but I'm primarily interested in finance. Oh, so when are you going to learn finance? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> my free time. You might want to take my classes this spring. <laughs> this spring. All right, I'm full. I have one more semester to go. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, you for, thank you very much.